morning, who I know many of you are really relishing to listen to. So allow me to go through uh, the details of Professor Jonathan Janssen. He is the Vice Chancellor and Rector of the University of the Free State and President of the South African Institute of Race Relations. He holds a PhD from Stanford University, an MS degree from Cornell University, and an honorary doctorate of education from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and Cleveland State University, USA. Professor Janssen will return to Stanford University at the end of the year to take up a fellowship. He is a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and a fellow of the Academy of Science of the Developing World. His book, Knowledge in the Blood, Confronting Race and the Apartheid Past, was listed as one of the best books of that year by the American Libraries Association. His new book, Schools That Work, uses video documentaries to capture what happens inside disadvantaged schools, which nevertheless produce the best results in physical science and mathematics in South Africa. This book has been sent to every high school in the country. He also writes popular books like Great South African Teachers, We Need to Talk, and We Need to Act, and he's a columnist for The Times. In 2013, he was awarded the Education Africa Lifetime Achiever Award in New York, and the Spend Love Award from the University of California for his contributions to tolerance, democracy, and human rights. In May 2014, he received an honorary Doctor of Letters degree at the University of Vermont, and recently, Knowledge in the Blood also won the Naif Al Roden Prize, the largest award from the British Academy for the Social Science and Humanities, for its contribution to scholarly excellence and transcultural understanding. Now, his latest book, Leading for Change, Race, Intimacy, and Leadership on Divided University Campuses has just been released by Routledge. And next year, he plans to publish a new book called Race, Romance, and Reprisal among University Students. Isn't that interesting? Second R, ne? Race, Romance, and Reprisal. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Professor Jonathan Young. I said I'm going to do something risque, Mr. Prof. So I want to take a selfie with you and live in the background. Because I can. I mean... <laughs> uh, good morning, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to the Free State. For how many of you, uh, it's this your first visit to the Free State province? Welcome, welcome, welcome. All of you from Cape Town. Well, you know, the people here tend to boast about the fact that they only come here to put in petrol at this ultra city. Right, so, but welcome to all of you. I've been here for six years, four months, two weeks, three days, and 13 hours, and I can tell you it is a fantastic place. A very different province from all the others. Here they put, this is one of those things that I still have enormous difficulties with, here they put built on, on food. <laughs> Both on food, it's ridiculous. Both on food, it's a different province. It's the only province in the country where if you come into the province of the N1, you are met with an announcement of sadness. It's a concentration camp site. And it reads in Afrikaans, Dam van Trane Bron from Hero. You know, most people, cities in the world sort of say, welcome to our city, you know. You know, this kind of sort of, you know, PR crap you just saw on this road. But most, most cities in the world do that. You know, I've not yet seen a cheetah yet, except for some friends of mine. But um, uh, by and large, by and large, you don't come into a place of sadness. And if you go all the way to the middle, on the other side of the city, there's another place of sadness uh, the Women's Memorial. Huge sadness. And so, so it's a place in which people are very sad. There's huge memories here. And they try to make up for it by giving the places exotic names like Bethlehem. <laughs> I can assure you Jesus wasn't born there. I mean, the place is cold. You know, uh, Paris. When my students come and see me, they say, I'm from Paris. It actually is Paris. <laughs> Frankfurt. Interesting, interesting. But welcome. I'm really, really not happy to be here. Today's a special day in my life, you know. Uh, so I promised my wife I would be home for today just to spend the day with her, since today we are married for 27 years. So I thought, I thought, right now, I thought, this would be a day in which I can just spend time with, you know, uh, the wife. 
And so when I got up early this morning to come and prepare to be here, she was of course not amused, and so I thought I'd make a joke just to sort of cheer up. So, and it had more or less that effect, because uh, I said to her that, you know, today we are married 27 years, but remember my goal here is to, to you know, cheer up. Thank you. So I said to her, do you realize that that's the same number of years that Mandela was in prison? Oh, Lord. <laughs> so she assumed I was comparing my marriage to incarceration. It just did not go well. It did not go well at all. And of course, I didn't see her face because I was brushing my teeth, so I kept digging, as men tend to do. So I said, maybe I will also now be released. Well, that, that did not go down well at all. Anyway, so here I am, having to abuse you folk who clearly don't have, uh, have too much time in your hands. This is what I want to talk to you about. What a great school can teach the conference industry. Now, I happen to say hotels a lot in South Africa. It's the worst experience you can possibly have. Absolutely. Whether you go to Britia or whether you go to the Cape Town, convention center, or whether you go to, you know, wherever you go, it is, you just see stuff. And because my wife works in this industry, you know, she used to do help with the grading of places. There's two people you must never go out with, to a restaurant or to a hotel. The one is with your wife, the other is with Tebe Kalafeng. I mean, Tebe, <laughs> Tebe literally, one day in Pretoria, you remember that? He calls the guy for messing and then using a dirty cloth to clean up the mess. Oh my Lord. He took the man apart because Tebe is actually not a South African. He's got a standard, and that's what I want to talk to you about. So what can I... This, listen, this is a miserable time in our country. Let's just be honest. Let's stop fooling each other. This is a miserable time. The economy is tanking. I don't care what the ANC calls it. The economy is tanking. Okay? And when you grow at less than 0.5%, you shit. Let me put it to you, since you're reading all these sort of upbeat... You're supposed to be upbeat in your industry, right? You know what I'm talking about. You're not a five star, you're a three star, but you put five on there. You know, hands up, those who do it. <laughs> Live the light. You know who you are. The economy is tanking. Our schools don't work for 80% of our children. It's a fact. It's a fact. Our universities have no future, I can tell you now. In 15 years' time, the top 10 universities are going to look like the bottom 10, and then we'll be happy. You know, at the height of the Soweto 76 crisis, I was a student at the time. Not once in the first three years was a school burnt. Not once. Yeah, the mayor's house was burnt. But a school was never burnt. In one week, we burnt more than 20 schools in Buwani. We're in trouble. In serious trouble. And unless we take a hard look at ourselves in every industry, whether it's the conference industry, whether it is higher education, whether it is hospitals, unless we really as South Africans start doing something about this, we're going down the tubes very fast. So what I tend to do as I go around the country is to talk to farmers and farm laborers, to domestic workers and madams, to uh, schools that work and schools that don't, and I try to give people a sense of what can be done if we pay attention. So I want you to pay attention to a school, one of several schools in which we try to understand why, despite an ecology of deprivation, the school does well. And there are lessons in here that goes well beyond education. So let me play that movie, I submit my I'm coming around with the mic to ask you, what did you see? What did you feel? What did you hear? What did you hear? South Africa is a beautiful country, it's strange. But if we neglect education, we are living in this country, to Norway. Being in the education sector is a service. You change and transform the life of a person so that they come to understand that what they want to achieve is achievable. This year we have got 2,285 learners. 478 learners in grade 1. I think that is the largest number in the country. We produce 325 bachelor's class 
and the 99 percent has mathematics and 98 has physical science. The ordinary pass, it will not help our children and it won't help our country. Take out my chemistry books. I want the notebook first. There is the nucleus. The nucleus of any given atom contains what? In education. There is what we call the hidden curriculum. There is what we call the formal curriculum. Now the hidden curriculum is very, very important. Kids learn from the emotions of the educator. They learn from the behavior of the educator. Despite the learning that they do, the formal learning in class. Can you come forward and show me where you are measuring your bond length from? Remember what I always say. Remember what I always say, guys. There is no wrong answer in science, is it? Yes. We only make mistakes and we correct the mistakes. Fine. Many people have failed to teach science because they have told kids that science is difficult. And right at the beginning of the year, I've always taught my learners that science is one of the easiest subjects that they can ever come across. Science is practical, so whenever they are involved in what is taking place, then they learn as much as they play. It's a child-centered approach. It's, it's stronger. In which setup do we find it easier to break this joint? Where we are holding with one hand or where we are holding with two hands? It's important for me as an educator to understand the prior knowledge that they have within them and then build upon what they already know. It's not like the educator knows all and the kids know nothing. Kids are not tabular racers. We have been always the top school in Limpopo province and we want all our learners to get their bachelors so that they can get entry into the university. The informatics is very much effective in getting quality results. You don't give them tests, they won't study. You teach, you assess, you teach, you assess, you teach, you assess. No one got 50 out of 50. So when you ended with your test, you just write correction. After each term, we analyze the results, we call the learners, then we compare the previous year with the current year. They are so motivated when they see the previous class performing so well. The culture of excellence pushes everybody to Okay, this is easy. It's important for me to teach it as the principal because it's a matter of leading by example and also to have a feel of what they are experiencing in those classes. We have what we call team teaching. In each grade, you find teachers to the learning area because of the large enrollment. Sometimes you pair the master teacher with them advice. That teamwork it makes us a winning team. I'm going to make a solution with this. As far as organizing our learners, we organize them according to the performance ability. You realize that it's either you help the weak one and the one who is fast loses interest in what is taking place and by so doing the learning is lost. If you are to focus on the first learner, this slow learner becomes discouraged. They feel more prepared to be involved in all the learning that takes place when they are among us themselves. Can you explain to me? This is the importance of separating the two so that we can give them separate attention. Okay, when you added a glory acid, you increase the concentration of CL that favor the reverse reaction. This is a living proof to show that the educators can do something. Even though it is overcrowded, you can't blame because of the number we are not performing. Yeah. It is the teachers who make the changes. President Mandela said education is the only weapon to defeat poverty. <laughs> Get a good pass in grade 12, then that good pass is the message.
to you. What is it about this school, from what you saw here and heard here, that makes it a good school? I think the teachers' involvement, involvement and attitudes. In, in teaching the, the children and actually interested in, in getting the outcomes that they need. That be a bit of idea. That was hopeless answer. Tracy! <laughs> I saw passion from the teachers. And I, and I also saw practical examples that children visualize. They can actually see it. Not just getting the, um, you know, writing it down. They're actually showing them how to do it. I love these three said graduates. Yes! What makes this a great school? The students' passion and the teachers' passion. You've had passion already. Don't be like Rhodes University. Imitate everyone. One thing I did like was to stream the kids that did not, none of the kids, I don't know, if they were, they wouldn't concentrate when the stronger ones are there, so they were together and working together. <coughs> What makes this a great school? I saw joy. I saw excitement for education. Let me ask you, you saw joy. Here's my question. Is joy, <laughs> is joy the dependent variable or the independent variable? In other words, do they come into the school with joy or is it the consequence of something else? It seems like it's generated as a school. Ah! Because nobody gets up happy in the morning, right? <laughs> So something happens in the organization, whether it's a school or a hotel, amen? Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So here's something very interesting. This school, it seems to me, can teach us a few things. Let me go to my first little, uh, just remember the guys here in the Africa. So yeah? Ah, okay. Thank you. The first thing worth noting here is that the school, despite everything around it, sets a standard and they stick to it. Now, this is not a South African school because if you went to a South African school, a typical South African school, you would be told about pass rates of, what's the official pass rate for most of you know, you know, you're like my students. I come, I teach first year students at the university. When I come with the mic, they already say no before I ask the question. And the other day, a student who didn't know that my second language is Afrikaans, so when I came with the microphone, she closed her eyes. This really happened. And she started to pray. And this is, and this is what she said. Ach, here, mag hier die plaag net voorbij gaan. May this play pass over me. I have never thought of myself as a play. But you were like my students, oh Lord, please. This is the only country in the world that sets for several grade 12 subjects a pass rate of 30%. It is disgusting. And for other subjects, a pass rate of 40%. This is the only country in the world in which more than 80% of the kids do dumb math. It's called mathematical literacy. By the way, do any of you have kids at school? Yes. Make sure the kid doesn't do math lit. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. They're just poor, taught poorly. Make sure they do mathematics. For very good reason. First of all, they won't get into any significant uh, field of study. But secondly, there's nothing wrong with that. Do you know what subject in South African schools gets the highest mark? Gets the highest mark? Life orientation, which is actually something the church should do. <laughs> Not a bloody school. And last year, the school with the highest marks in life orientation in South Africa was the school in Limpopo. It so happened to be the school with the highest number of teenage pregnancies. So show me the relationship between high marks in life orientation and big stomachs. I don't get it. But the school reflects the society. We pride ourselves in ignorance. We tell young comrades, comrade, you want to go high? Forget school. Look at our leaders. You know, when I go to Tanzania, they pride themselves on their leaders' education. Ah, Malibu, two years. 
Nairere. Dr. Nairere to you, by the way. And Marimu means in Swahili? No, the, You said no before I asked. <laughs> Marimu means the teacher. We pride ourselves on what we don't know. We set such a low standard that we pride ourselves that we just escaped jump status. Is that where we want to play? No. So tell me something. What is the standard you set for your industry, sir? The highest possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's an answer like the Miss World thing, you know, world peace. No, I mean, talk to me like a human being, you know? Give me two or three things that you set as a standard and tell me why I don't see it when I go to a hotel. <laughs> when I go, let me just tell you, as an as a, as a ordinary person, right, who must raise money for the university, that's what I do, so I have to sleep in strange places. This is a typical morning when I get up and I want to check out. This is a long line, okay? You would imagine in the age of technology you could check out and just go. 20 minutes ago, I asked you to bring my car around. I'm still waiting for the fucking car. <laughs> Why is it that when I get there at 2 o'clock, after a long transcontinental flight, you tell me, sorry sir, your room is still not ready? What the hell were you doing? Why are you using a vacuum to clean the passage at 10 o'clock at night? I want to sleep, damn it. So don't talk to me about standards in our schools when you don't have standards in your industry. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> when people look at you and they, their very face no. tells you, why the hell did you show up? <laughs> and then they have these gimmicks. So if you fill out one of these three forms and you become a man, I don't want to become a fucking member. I want to bed. I want to sleep. Be practical! It's like this bloody pick and pay things. Are you a smart shopper? No! Just give me my stuff! Do you have the Willis my, my School card, sir? Just give me the stuff I want to go. And so you make up for incompetence with paperwork. So don't blame the schools, you are like the schools. Do you think I like wearing a tie as an overweight black man? <laughs> but I don't go into any South African school without the tie because I want the students to understand like the principal and teachers in this, there is a standard that we set. Did you know that if you went to my geology class in the honors class today, most of the students in there come from a school, not in the Free State, not in Gauteng, not in the Western Cape, in the Popo from this school in Bilby. Most of the students doing a CA, a Chartered Accounting qualification at our university, per school, most of them come from this one school. That's why we go and recruit at Mbiwi. I personally go and recruit at Menzi High School in Umlazi because I get the top students. The people in those schools set a standard. When I came here, our university had the second lowest pass rate in South Africa of the 24 at, the, at that time, public universities. Our pass rate in four years went up from 60% to 82% this year. Same students, different message. And when I raised the entry requirement, I got an ugly letter from you know which political party. <laughs> Professor, you are racist. I said, no, you're the fucking racist because you don't believe that black people can achieve exactly the same way as any other person. I don't look at my students and see disadvantage. I look at my students and I see potential. That's what this principal does in a rural school in Toyanto. That's our problem. We don't believe that we can do better. 
They set a standard and they stick to it. Number two, they hold high expectations despite their value. Oh man, what does the principal say as he hands out from the math test the previous night? He hands back the scripts. I can see the people here freezing up. <laughs> what does the principal say as he hands back the marked papers? <laughs> <laughs> he says to them, nobody got 50 out of 50. What was he really saying? They didn't do well. No, 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 please, please, please don't give me a good answer. What does he really say? You can do better. You can do better. What the man is really saying is, I expected you. I expected someone to get 50 out of 50. Oh my Lord. Just imagine we went through this country, whether it's in the energy sector or the education sector, whether it's in politics or economy, and we went with the understanding but the people here yeah, can get, you know what I mean, 50 out of 50. For 17 years, my university didn't have a single A-rated scientist because they kept telling each other, if you publish in Farmers Weekly, you can become a professor. <laughs> now we have A-rated scientists because we raised the bar. We expected people to get 50 out of 50. If you treat your staff like idiots, they will perform like idiots. But if you set the standard up, they turn out differently. Number three, it's the people stupid. I'm playing here on Bill Clinton's slogan, it's the economy stupid. Let me tell you something. The reason you are in trouble in your sector, the reason universities and schools are in trouble, we hire people for all the wrong reasons. In fact, there's a horrible report which I'm grateful the Minister of Basic Education exposed is the majority union basically selling posts to people. And I can tell you, you can never build a great country if you don't choose people because they have talent, because they work like dogs, because they prepare to put their bodies, if you don't have that. I've taught university students all over the world. Let me tell you, they're all the same. They know nothing. <laughs> but when I teach American students, they talk all the time as if they know everything. You teach South African students, they slump in their chair. How many of you, let me prove this to you, how many of you who went to university will remember at least one class in which the professor said something like this. Welcome to biochemistry 139. By the end of the first semester, half of you will be gone. Hands up if you had something. You see that? That only happens in South Africa. When I went to my first class at Cornell University, the professor also said, look to your left and look to your right. And I said, well, Frank, you have no salvia. He said, look to your left, you might be looking at the next president of IBM. Very different message. And look to your right, you might be looking at the next president of Apple. A very different kind of goal. It is about the people. And if you're hiring somebody because they're related to you, not only is that wrong, you won't get the right person. If you're hiring somebody because they look like you, pray like you, make love like you, you do, I can tell you now, you're messing up your organization. Choose the best person. And don't give me this crap. You give me this research that shows that we tend to hire people who look like us. You put a lot of white Afrikaans people in a room, they will hire white Afrikaans people. You put a lot of black people in a room on a panel, they will hire black people. 
You put a lot of colored people, guess what? They are higher colored. It's just the way you guys have been screwed. <laughs> Sorry, I should have chosen my words. <laughs> you choose people. You see, you choose as English people even if you to get them from England. And then they call it fit. You don't fit in with the organization. What they really mean is you're not like us. Since when is transformation about being like us? It's supposed to be being not like us. How many of you Christians this morning? Let me just tell you what hypocrites you are. How many of you Christians this morning went onto your Facebook and put a post there? Especially you evangelicals. Ramadan Karim to all my Muslim friends. You don't. Because you're so tied up in your own identity you can't recognize your brother and sister's identity. It's not somebody else's ass. We have found the enemy in his ass. My kids are much better than me because we raised them differently. My son came home two years ago with a white girl. Do you know how upset I was? I said, Mikhail, of all the beautiful black women in this country, you shot me with a white kid. <laughs> So two weeks before the wedding, this really happened. He said to me, Dad, you can no longer avoid meeting Catherine's parents. <laughs> so my wife and I jumped in the car in Bloemfontein, drove to Linwood, Pretoria, to go and meet the enemy. And when we got there, <laughs> when we got there, when we got there, I'm just being honest here, I'm just being honest here. So when we got there, on the one side of the table sat the black Jansons, and on the other side sat the white Bartlett's. Those of you who know me know I'm a wordsmith, so every word is chosen carefully in advance. <laughs> so my son came tiptoeing over to me, he says, Dad, whatever you do, do not embarrass us. <laughs> I said, son, have I ever embarrassed you? Of course, he rolled his eyes. <laughs> I let the green stuff go by first, the salads. <laughs> when the meat came, I decided to strike. <laughs> and I spoke to these white people as if they were deaf. I said, Sir! <laughs> what first crossed your minds? when my son decided to darken your doorstep. <laughs> Model sees. Woo! My poor boy went under the table with Catherine, his wife, his now wife. But I love the way Brenda responded, the, 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 the mother, mother. And the reason I liked it, she didn't respond in, you see, I'm from Cape Town originally, and I'm just being honest here. I'm just putting my weakness, my brokenness on the table. If you want to drive me nuts, when I go to UCT and these people speak English, as if they're still in the Midlands of England. Oh, you know, if they speak, it's if they bishop's court, instead of bishop's ladies. You know. <laughs> so Brenda spoke to me in working class English, which immediately connected me to her. She said, well, I said to myself, Brenda, Brenda, I said, are you truly a non-racist? So when she saw my black boy, she didn't reflect on him. She reflected on herself. I ran towards her, gave her a big hug because she's big. And I said, welcome <laughs> to our family. And we become better friends. What's the point of the story? My children are better than their parents. I often tell parents, parents would say to me at workshops on race and racism, they'd say to me, Professor, how would I know I'm a good parent? I said, very easy. When your children are better than you. Not better in the moral sense, but better in the sense that they can make better choices because they don't carry the baggage. Because you see, when my children were born, and they opened their eyes in our home. They saw people who spoke Afrikaans, people who spoke Isizulu, people who spoke Setswana, people who spoke Hebrew. They saw in our home Jews and Muslims. They saw in our home 
gay and straight people. So when they came to their political senses, they found it very strange to be in a country where people are uncomfortable with difference. But from the day they were born, they knew what it was as young children to go into Shabbat on a Friday night with our Jewish friends, or to go to the Long Street Mosque in Cape Town with our Muslim friends. They knew how to have bigger hearts rather than narrow mind. The children are a product. And by the way, for you who are parents, let me just tell you, I can predict with certainty whether your child is going to have racial problems based on who comes to a briar to your home on a Friday night. I can predict it the final. And by the way, my experience at both Turkey's and here at Free State is girls change in six months. Guys take 18 months. Can I prove it to you? If I came in here with an ugly baby and the room was full of women, what do women tend to say? Oh, no words. Oh. I bring that same baby into a room full of guys. What do guys say? I'm not the father. It's a very different, very, very different, very different response. Very different response. Guys take a little longer, a little longer than women. Okay? And so it is about that. And so my daughter decided, oh, this was so horrible. In fact, I had a long chapter there early this morning. She decided that now that her son, brother got married, she must now also make the plan. So she brings home a guy. He leaves Durban to come into our home at 3 in the morning. The bus was going to arrive here in Bloemfontein at 3 a.m. Now in my culture, you cannot as a boy come into my home at 3 a.m. If I'm asleep. So I woke up and in comes this young man full of energy in my kitchen towards me holding out his hand. Did I ask for his hand? No, so I left him hanging. I said, son, what is your name? He says, Mpo. I said, ah. All my friends called Mpo are women. What have you not told my children? You can't be too short. You can't be too short. Pain and You know, you just can't be too short. You can't be too short. I need to know. I said, where are you from? He says, Belito. I said, ah, there is no, I've lived in this country all my life. There is no bloody place called Belito. It's not even a Zulu name. Belito. So my daughter says to me, Dad, Google it. <laughs> 3 a.m., I opened the laptop. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, there is actually a place <laughs> north of Durban called Belito? How was I know? So I realized I'm not getting very far with this kid. Now, you see, my daughter was born in Menlo Park, California, and when she was born by the Caesarean section, I was there. And while the doctor saw blood and guts, I saw the most beautiful girl in the whole wide world. And I wrote down 10 questions right there in the world that any man who dares to date my daughter <laughs> must successfully pass all. Ten questions. So I went upstairs to the safe, opened it up, took out this page which was yellowed with age. <laughs> Brought it down and there sat and born next to my beautiful daughter. And as she had already explained to him the rules. <laughs> so I said to him, question number one. By the way, any of you who have, guys, if you have daughters, I'm happy to share this thing. <laughs> I said, question number one. Criminal record? <laughs> He said, none. I said, bank account? He said, none. I said, previous girlfriends? He said, none. So I knew I'm not getting very far with the kids. So I went straight to question number six, because question number six has tripped up every young man who's ever come through that door. So I went straight to question number six, because she has a Christian. My Bible is very clear in Ezekiel 3 and verse 9 that your daughter must not marry an uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> I 
So I looked him straight in the if you haven't stood there at 2 a.m. in the morning. Don't ask people to do things you haven't done. And this principle in one of the biggest schools in the country is teaching yes. mathematics. The reason I do research, write books, is very simple. One, I enjoy it. But the other reason is that none of my professors can come in and say they're more busy than what I am. None of them dare do that when they have excuses for not producing quality research. I say, oh, you too busy? Let's go. <laughs> and so the leaders get down with the followers. Number five. Because these children are in a good school, did you notice when, the <laughs> just go back to the previous one, and then the previous one. I am so sorry, I forgot to say something very important. Did you notice something about the, math, the physics teacher, the chemistry teacher, the two chemistry teachers? Did you notice anything? If you're South African and you have a ear for music, what did you notice? <laughs> of course you did notice, but you are too polite to say what you noticed about the teacher, the two chemistry teachers, the guy and the woman. The guy, judging by his accent, is from Zimbabwe. The woman chemistry teacher is from India. That is why if I had my own school, I would never hire a South African. Because you're hiring package. You're hiring laziness. I think the English word is slop hut. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, the Zimbabwean teacher doesn't come in with a history of striking. Doesn't come in with a history. Do you know this recent research has shown that teachers bunk more than children? Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. It's true. So the Zimbabwean teacher teaches weekends. He teaches on public holidays. He teaches in the school holidays. In other words, he comes to school with a determination to make sure that every child is taught as if it was his own child. He doesn't do what many of our teachers do. They disrupt the poor schools in the township and they put their kids in the Model C schools near mine. That is wrong. And if I were ever to become a minister of education, which by the way is not, no, 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 it's not going to happen. <laughs> You stand a much better chance of finding Osama bin Laden alive. <laughs> the first rule I would have is you would teach in the same school in which your children are. You would see a big difference. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah, immediately. It's too easy to disrupt the children, poor children's education, and keep your kids in a safe place. 
the other teachers from India. They don't come. They're competent and they work hard. Think about it. I'm not saying there aren't South African teachers, obviously they are. But nine out of ten you get into schools and it looks as if everybody lost their relative. Let's go back to the last one. Because these young people are in good schools, did you notice that the Indian teacher doesn't say they're going to a tea vet? So they're going to university. Too few kids get into university per size of the population, by the way. And because they get into university, every kid from Mbilwe High School, I can give you the data, gets a job, whether it's in geology, or as an actuarial scientist, or as an accountant, they get jobs. Don't let anybody tell you a university degree doesn't give you a job. In South Africa, 82% of young people, according to the CBE, Center for Development Enterprise, actually do get jobs. So that we don't have a high graduate unemployment rate. Compared to almost any other country in the developing world, we actually have actually good uptake of graduates in the economy. It might not be the first job you wanted, but you will be in a job. The World Bank recently did a study of 144 countries. This is an amazing study. If you're interested, email me, I'll give it to you. And what the study showed is that the private rates of return to higher education is highest among 144 countries in South Africa. In other words, in South Africa, if you get a degree, you are 12 times more likely to find a job than if you have no degree. The private rates of return are very high. The social rates of return are more or less the same for Chile, Brazil, South Africa, and Argentina. But the private, and that is why, when I see a young person crossing the stage, and I know, can I just quickly share with you one story? There's a young man across the road here. He goes to the worst school in South Africa. The worst school in South Africa is in Nyanga, Cape Town. It's called Oscar Bett High School. Oscar Bett was a great man, by the way. It's a pity the school is named after such a great man. But it is, the teachers, they don't teach. They sit in the staff room all day. But this guy got 100% in history. How did I know that? One of the markers from St. Cyprian's High School called me and said, Professor, I'm not supposed to tell you. But no kid from Bishops, Sachs, Westerford, none of the kids in the Western Cape got 100% in history, but a kid from Oscar Petter. And I knew Oscar Petter because I'd worked there for three years trying to turn the school around. So I found this guy on Facebook. And I called him. And I said to him, Sidagor, what are your plans? He said, I'm just on my way to Golden Arrow. Those of you from Cape Town who know that Golden Arrow is a bus company. He was on his way to Golden Arrow to get a license to drive a bus, 100% in the street. I said, could you do me a favor? Pack your bags, go to the bus station in Cape Town, take a different bus. To Bloemfontein. The next morning he arrived, I picked him up with another kid we brought from Delft, had breakfast in our home. Guess who is about to walk across the stage? Sorry, I put this kid is amazing. He's about to walk across the stage. He's the prime, the head of a residence. In the 140 year history of our university, we have never had a residence with a fully stocked library. He built the library from the ground up, the bus driver from Golden Arrow. And guess what? He's about to walk across the stage with a BA degree in teaching in the senior phase because he's devoted his life to teaching history. history. Why did Sinukolo Sam get 100% in history? Passion. His teacher was from Zimbabwe. <laughs> And I'm flying in the teacher from Harare because South Africa, with its anti immigrant xenophobic policies, told the guy to go back to his country. So I'm flying him in from Harare so that he can gown his students. Not the registrar, he can gown his students. Good school, good university, good job. This school teaches me how to be a better leader. It should teach you how to run a better industry. Thank you very much.